Ha! 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 Oh, <laughs> hey, how's it going? Didn't see you guys there. I'm just working on my Link impressions for my new audition. What am I auditioning for, you ask? Why, what else but the Legend of Zelda musical? You guys seriously don't believe that's a real thing? Well, check this out! It's dangerous to go alone. Take this! <laughs> All I gotta do now is send in my audition tape and wait for the results. Oh, I'm so excited. Wish me luck, guys. <clears throat> Dear Sir Andash or Madam, you sound like a pregnant Labrador being eaten by an angry horde of rabid chinchillas. Please don't ever audition again, you are terrible. Sincerely, Plasm. That stands for The Legend of Zelda Musical, you twat. Huh. Well, I guess you could say my audition was criminally underrated. Kinda like these five Zelda games. Top five underrated Legend of Zelda games, yeah! We're starting off this list with one of the more recent Zelda titles, Skyward Sword. And I honestly don't know why this game receives so much darn criticism. I remember Skyward Sword being really popular when it first came out, but for some reason, as the years went on, people seemed to start looking at the game in a more negative light. Seriously, how does a game go from getting a 10 on Game Informer to suddenly being called one of the worst Zelda games ever made? Personally, I don't think the game is all that bad, but that should be kind of obvious since it's on an underrated Zelda games list. Read the title, people. So getting down to business, I'm willing to bet it's the motion controls that played a large part in the negative opinions that this game received. In older Zelda titles, controlling your character was something that you never really had to think about. You could press the X button to select a bomb, and then you press the A button to throw the bomb. Performing an action was simple and to the point. But now, with the motion controls, in order to do the exact same thing, you had to lift up your hand, press a button on the Wii Remote, and then swing your arm in an arc facing the direction you wanted the bomb to go. That only takes, what, maybe two or three extra seconds to accomplish, but when you have to perform the same action several hundred times throughout the game, it can really add up motion controls required a lot more work and energy to accomplish the exact same thing that you could formerly do with just a simple button press. Not to mention, you probably looked pretty stupid flailing your arms around to swing your imaginary sword. Make sure that strap's on or you're gonna bust your TV, okay? Another point of criticism that was directed to this game was the lack of new locations that you could visit. In Twilight Princess, for example, you went to a forest, a volcano, a desert, a city in the clouds, the Twilight Zone, an ice castle, and an underwater city, just to name a few. In Skyward Sword, however, you got a forest, a volcano, and a desert. <laughs> really pushing the envelope, aren't we guys? Granted, you unlocked more of each zone as you progressed further in the game, but it did still leave gamers wanting a little bit of variety. And that's without even mentioning that the main overworld in this game was really tiny. After the massive oceans of Wind Waker and the huge open plains of Twilight Princess, Skyloft in comparison was pretty minuscule. Sure, you could fly around for a bit and you could search for treasure, but after that was done, there was never really that much incentive to get off the main quest and just explore. So does any of this mean that Skyward Sword was a bad game? Definitely not, for starters. The motion controls, love them or hate them, allowed the developers to create challenges and puzzles that just would not have been possible with a regular controller. That one part in the first symbol where you make that giant eyeball follow the tip of your sword, that was really clever, and that was a good example of the outside the box thinking this game forced you to do. The boss fights were also another huge highlight for me. Because you had to use motion controls when fighting the bosses, they required a lot more precision and finesse than your typical Zelda bosses. And as a result, when you finally beat them, you felt way cooler and much more accomplished than if you had just been mashing buttons the entire time. In fact, the final fight against Demise is one of my favorite boss battles in any video game ever, and it was only possible because of those motion controls. It really felt like you were fighting in some sort of epic duel, and that one part at the end where you jump up in the air and stab Demise in the heart, that would not have been half as cool if you had done that just sitting on your butt and mashing the A button. Granted, you still look stupid doing all of this, but hey, at least you were having fun. And isn't that the main reason why we play games in the first place? For fun. This game is far from perfect, but if you give it a chance, I don't think you'll You'll regret it. When people start talking about their favorite Zelda games, you can bet you'll hear from all the standard heavy hitters. Ocarina of Time, Wind Waker, Majora's Mask, and now for a lot of people, Breath of the Wild. By the way, shameless plug, if you haven't checked out my Breath of the Wild video, you totally should. Link in the description. However, the Zelda games I never hear people talk about are the portable ones. More specifically, the 2DS games, Phantom Hourglass, and Spirit Tracks. What? You don't remember these? 
Not surprising, I've literally heard nothing about these games since I last played them about 8 years ago, and mentioning that it's been almost a decade since I've played these has started to make me feel rather old. Hashtag 90s kids are now becoming 90s adults. Ugh, it's scary. Let's start out with Phantom Hourglass. What was good about it? Well, the game was a direct sequel to Wind Waker, so that was pretty cool. And if you enjoyed the sailing mechanics in that first game, you were in luck, because you had a boat in here as well. There was also this huge overworld to explore, and the game rewarded you for going off the beaten path by hiding lots of special islands and easter eggs off to the edges. The dungeons were also pretty fun, and I remember the game using the DS hardware to create some very interesting puzzles. Does anyone remember that one part of the game where you're supposed to scream at a character so you literally have to yell into the DS microphone? Pro tip, if you're in a public location and don't want to look mentally deranged, I would suggest just blowing into the microphone. That will accomplish the same thing. This game was kind of like a portable Wind Waker, and it was a good way to get your Zelda fix on the go. Or at least, it would have been were it not for one thing. The Temple of the Ocean King. This thing right here was the number one turnoff for the majority of people wanting to play this game. It was basically this giant super dungeon you had to keep revisiting throughout your adventure, and as you progress through the main story, more and more parts of this dungeon would be unlocked for you to explore. Thinking on it now, it's kind of like Mementos in Persona 5. The idea of a gradually expanding super dungeon was cool and all, but there was a glaring issue with its execution. The Temple of the Ocean King played dirty. Want to fight this enemy over here? Nope. He kills you in one hit and you can't even hurt him. Hey, you want to thoroughly explore all the rooms to make sure you get all the treasure? Not a chance, buddy. You have a time limit and you died from standing in the open for too long. Hey, want to resume playing the game at the floor you left off on? Get with the times, Grandpa. You have to start back from the very beginning. The Temple of the Ocean King did not hold your hand, and I think that a lot of people were expecting a handheld Zelda game to be a lot easier than it actually was. So obviously, these more strict mechanics were a major turnoff for a lot of people, and it kept a good chunk of people, I think, from playing this game. But if you give it a chance, I think you'll actually be surprised at all the game has to offer. Sure, it was hard and sometimes frustrating, but it was also something unique to the series that had never been done before. For example, I mentioned that there are some enemies in this area that can kill you in just one hit. So in order to not acquaint yourself with the game over screen, you had to change your playstyle to adapt to this new threat. You had to start sneaking around your foes instead of fighting them. And in some places, it felt like you were playing Metal Gear Zelda. <laughs> Who would have thought that sentence would ever exist? I even ended up enjoying the arbitrary time limit that so many people hated. You have a certain amount of time to make it through all the floors, but each room you're in has lots of specific passages and secret exits that you can only access once you acquire the right item. This means that when you come back through these stages with the required items, you could burn through the parts that used to give you a lot of trouble. One floor that may have taken you six or seven minutes to beat before, you can now do in just two or three. And let me tell you, breezing through something that used to kick your butt is super satisfying. This kind of feels like a Zelda speedrunning game, and I for one hope we see something like this again in the future. And as for Spirit Tracks, well, it was like Phantom Hourglass, but with trains. If you end up liking one of these games, then chances are you'll probably like the other two. <laughs> I've never really understood the criticism that people bring against Twilight Princess. People complain that it's just basically a prettier version of Ocarina of Time. But wasn't Ocarina of Time one of the greatest games ever made, according to Metacritic? Surely, if someone made you a fancy steak dinner, you wouldn't complain if they made it for you again tomorrow, right? Of course, food and video games are very different things, but hopefully you can see my point. If you just cannot bring yourself to like this game, then think of it as an expansion pack to Ocarina of Time. That came out eight years later, on a different console. Huh. This analogy is starting to break down a bit. Moving on, I remember being 10 years old when this game first came out, and I was all like, whoa, T-rated Zelda, it must be super hardcore. And to be honest, the game definitely had some dark moments, especially at the end where you're fighting Ganondorf, and when you beat him, Zant pops up, he's like, hey, what's up, crack, and he breaks Ganondorf's neck. That is so violent. Now, don't get me wrong, compared to stuff like Dead Space 2, this game was basically Teletubbies. But it was cool getting to explore a darker side of Hyrule and to see some really creepy and imaginative imagery. I I think the other main beef people had with this game was the wolf form that Link took on for about a quarter of the game. A lot of people didn't like playing as a wolf because it wasn't like a traditional Zelda game, and... Wait a second! So we can complain about a game being too similar, but also too different at the same time? Man, we gamers can be hard to please sometimes. But getting back on topic, wolf form, love it or hate it, offered up yet again a new way to play the game. And if you find that the wolf sections keep you from finishing the game, go and try Ocarina instead. I hear the games are practically the same anyways. To wrap this up, if you like Ocarina of Time, don't mind running on all fours for a few hours, and are into neck snapping, then Twilight Princess might be right up your alley. 
some friends of mine have told me before that Triforce Heroes isn't actually a real Zelda game. And in a sense, I guess it isn't. If you think that a Zelda game needs to have an epic story, an open world, and a single player focused narrative, then this is not the game for you. If, however, you can realize that this is more of a goofy co-op game instead of your typical straightforward Zelda game, then you'll have a much better time. I was in the camp of people that were really confused when this game was first announced. After A Link Between Worlds was released and was excellent, we were all expecting a follow-up to that style of game. What we got instead was a title where three different Links dress up to see which dress pairs best with their new penguin outfit? Who made this game? If you could not tell, this game does not take itself very seriously. Triforce Heroes was more concerned with giving you and your friends a fun time while we not so patiently waited for the release of Breath of the Wild. I don't think that the goofy humor made the game bad, just different. And as long as you think of this as a Zelda light adventure that you can play with your friends, then you'll end up having a lot of fun. Next! <laughs> And now, my friends, we have finally arrived at the final underrated entry on this list, Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link. For me personally, this is one of those rare titles that has that, that special something. The ability to straddle the fine line between soul-crushingly difficult and mind-numbingly boring. But still, it's not as bad as a lot of people say it is. I think the main reason why it got so much hate, similar to every other game on this list, was because it was different in some way to the status quo. After the OG Legend of Zelda released, people were expecting more of the same. The prior game was a smashing success, and from a business perspective, if people really liked the first thing you made, then it would behoove you to make another thing just like it. Now your sequel might add a few new things to spice up the gameplay, but it will mostly be giving the audience more of the same. I think that if the third game in the series, A Link to the Past, had released immediately after the first Legend of Zelda, no one would have batted an eye. It's exactly what people expected out of a sequel. And to boot, it was a really good game. Zelda 2, on the other hand, switched to a very odd 2D perspective, and it added some strange RPG elements that you don't typically see in a traditional Zelda game. Although, let us remember that at the time of Zelda 2's release, there was not a traditional Zelda formula to design the game around. Nintendo had a brand new series, and maybe they weren't sure what direction they wanted their games to head in. Did they want to make a series like the first game, which everyone loved, or would they prefer to make a really weird 2D game that nobody liked? Hmm. Decisions, decisions. So to conclude, it's not the best game ever and I personally think it's awful, but hey, at least Nintendo was willing to experiment and try something new. In a time when adding a dog to a game is considered groundbreaking and innovative, it's nice to see some people willing to push the envelope and dare to be different. Was the thing they made very good? Personally, I can't stand this game, but hey, I know it's got its fans. And sometimes, you gotta get the bad ideas out of the way to make room for the good ones. Not your best work, Nintendo, but hey, you get a gold star for trying. Nice job. And there you have it, ladies and gents. Those were the top five criminally underrated Zelda games, at least according to this random guy on the internet. If you disagree with what I included and think that the list should have had some different games on it, then feel free to make your own list in the comments for everyone to see. Also, if you enjoyed the video, it would just be swell if you gave it a thumbs up. And if you want to or are already subscribed to the channel, make sure you click on that bell icon over there so you can join the super awesome Barbershop Notification Squad. Thanks for watching, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day. See ya.